Good evening for a third time. Before we actually get going, can I remind you that I did write a few books. Here's one of them, Secret Underground London. If you would like a copy, I'm happy to sign it. Just send me an email to nick at catford.info, nick at catford.info uh, after the webinar, and uh, then we can get something sorted out. Right, here we go on part three of uh, Secret Underground London. Um, most of it, of course, isn't actually secret, but my publisher, Nick McCamley, said it would sell a lot more books if we said it was secret. So uh, that's why uh, we did. Right, I'm going to turn my, uh, my mug off now and uh, we'll go through a few slides. Right, what is London? Uh, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, within the M25. Um, but if I think it's particularly interesting, then we might go just outside the M25. Now, where did we get to last time? Ah, that's where we got to last time. Uh, the extensive medieval building quarries in the Merstham area. We looked at some of them, but not all of them. So we're going to look at a few more now. Uh, uh, I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, so uh, this is where uh, the Cholden Quarry is located, um, very close to the junction of the M25 and the M23 motorways. Um, one of the entrances uh originally when i went this is um uh bedlam's bank uh quarry and when i first went there it was a a, a nasty sort of plastic tube uh about eight feet uh uh deep uh and that that was the way in eventually that all collapsed uh and uh a, a nice uh metal tube was put in so that is uh, uh the way in now um and there's uh our uh, dear departed friend Paul Soen, um, looking after a very attractive young lady uh, as she comes out of uh, Bedlam's Bank. Um, ooh, long time ago. This was 19, 1987. Um, the Surrey quarries were worked on the pillar and stall method, uh, with working faces or stalls uh, between approximately 8 or 14 feet in width. The pillars that left support the roof. Uh, were generally uh, eight to ten feet square um, and uh, lots of stone was split from the face using iron wedges now if you have a look uh, you can see some wedge marks in the in the stone there uh, and uh, if you look in that crack between the three wedge marks you can actually see uh, one of the wedges still in place um, still in place now if you if you get a trip to uh, the Cholden quarries uh, it should be possible for you to see that. Um, there's a, a, a typical pa uh, passageway at Cholden, Cholden Bottom. Uh, illustrates the instability of the roof in this area. Uh, notice the fault line in the roof that extends down through the left side of the pillar in the center of the picture. Um, it all looks very unstable when you go there, um, but uh, these pictures were taken 20 years ago. I doubt if uh, very much has changed. I did put a scale in. Um, Paul Soen always used to insist that I, I use the scale. So there is my scale. That is two feet. Um, I, I am not going to use metric. I'm sorry. Imperial is, uh, uh, is king as far as I'm concerned. So that, that uh, scale is two feet. And uh, there's lots of crawling there. There's an X uh, subrip member. Um, Vince Olkins uh, coming through one of the crawlways uh, at uh, Otley Wood. Uh, the the the, uh, the quarries at uh, at Cholden Bottom are divided uh, into Otley Wood and Bedlam's Bank and Rockshaw, um, but they are, they all join together in what is um, I think about eleven miles of accessible tunnels. So. Um, if you do want a trip there, it can be arranged through the Wheels and Cave and Mine Society, but there's 11 miles of accessible tunnels. So if there's 11 miles that is accessible, just imagine how much more there is that is uh, currently inaccessible or backfilled or collapsed. It's, it's a massive place. Um, several blocks of uh, uh, cut and roughly trimmed stone 
uh, are left in place in uh, several places in the quarries. So that is how the, uh, uh, the stone would have been cut, uh, ready to take out. Um, it would have been taken out uh, on sledges uh, pulled by oxen uh, or, or horses or ponies. And uh, we'll see uh, one or two of those that didn't actually make it out uh, shortly. Um, timber pit props were used. Um, they were okay at the time, but over the years they've rotted away. Uh, in fact, completely rotted away, uh, many of them. Uh, uh, but you can uh, uh, see the original uh, size of the of the pit prop by the hole that has been left. But uh, obviously, it's uh, it's propping up nothing anymore. Uh, and again, more more pit props, uh, timber pit props uh, are seen throughout the quarries. Um, and uh, I seem to have lost my picture see if i can get it back that's better uh timber prop pit props are seen throughout the quarries uh but none of them actually do anything anymore um but they they look they look uh, quite picturesque um now i said the uh uh animals are used to haul the uh uh the the sledges out with the uh, uh the stone on it and here's a rather unfortunate ox that was uh discovered during the exploration of an isolated section of the mine. Uh, mine quarry, they are quarries, but uh, a lot of people call them mine, so I'll, I'll use both terms there, that they'll both do. Um, <coughs> we think this, uh, this particular ox was uh, uh, trapped by roof fall, um, and there are literally thousands of uh, ox hoof prints in the floor, so uh, the poor fellow was obviously running around trying to get out and eventually uh, just ran out of puff and oxygen and just lay down and died. Uh, so uh, uh, a bit of a sorry, uh, sorry story for him. Uh, but it was 300 years ago now, so um, he's probably gone to heaven a long time ago. Um, and uh, the, the ox, the chances of you seeing the ox are probably quite slim. It's on a a very obscure part of the quarry that has actually been deliberately walled up so that people can't find it. And uh, uh, it's very hard to get hold of plans of the quarry. Um, but those plans that are available, that section is usually left off just uh, deliberately to stop people finding the ox uh, because it is so well preserved. But in one of the uh, main uh, haulage ways, uh, there's this other skeleton, which is... Uh, a horse of some sort um, and uh, this one is uh, not in as good condition as the ox <coughs> but uh, anyone visiting the quarry can see this but it will take you probably three hours uh, from the shaft entrance the, the the metal tube that we saw earlier it will take you three hours on the move all the time to actually get to this point uh, and uh, there is actually virtually nowhere you can stand upright um so it's crouched crouching down or crawling uh so it, it's hard going uh to make any progress in these quarries um but still very worthwhile um if that's your cup of tea um there are a number of uh on, yeah i missed uh, a, a, a number some original graffiti uh in the children bottom quarries um mainly names from the 18th century, but one place at the far east of Rockshaw Quarry, there are two strange mystic symbols, uh, mazes uh, on the left and a Celtic swastika on the right. Um, so those, those certainly need a, a little more interpretation. Um, this is the oldest date in the quarry. Uh, this has, has been uh, positively identified as accurate. It's 1609, uh, and it comes with five lines uh, written in Old English. Uh, it's been partially translated, and the first two lines say two weeks before midsummer 1609, uh, and the text ends with God is Majesty. So uh, that's on one of the main haulage routes. So if you do get yourself a visit to the Children Quarries, uh, uh, that is still there and undamaged. Right, so we've we've looked at the children quarries. Um, 
Here's one that you won't be able to, uh, to visit. Um, Gatton Park and Tower Wood mines or quarries lie in the west of the A23 Trunk Road, south of the M25, uh, a little to the north of the Royal Alexandra and Albert School. Uh, both of these mines were previously lost and rediscovered. Uh, this one was rediscovered uh, uh, when a hole appeared in the school's playing field. Um, and it was quite obvious what it was. So uh, they called in the local uh, caving group, which was uh, the Wheels and Cave and Mine Society. Uh, and uh, they gave them permission to excavate it uh, and to uh, get into the under, underground galleries, uh, which we knew must exist. Um, a shaft was put in, which you can see in the picture on the right. Um, sadly, it lasted but a few weeks. When everything was filled in again, uh, the whole lot collapsed again a few weeks later. But there's uh, a general view of the underground workings of Gatton Park. Uh, showing the large quantities of waste stone stacked against the haulage way. Um, there were uh, probably uh, three or four parallel passages uh, like this that were still accessible uh, when, when, when we got in. Um, but again, none of this uh, is now accessible because the shaft uh, that wheeled and put in uh, did, didn't last very long. Right, so we've looked at the, uh, the Cholton quarries. So let's take a look at uh, Quarry Dean. Uh, the Croydon, Merston and Gorston Railway, which was an extension of the Surrey Iron Railway, had its southern terminus at Merston. Uh, this was a horse-drawn plate way, uh, which opened to Croydon in 1803 and to Merston in 1805. It was the first public toll railway, providing a track for independent goods hauliers to use their own horses and wagons. Uh, one of the chief goods to be transported was building stone from the Cholden quarries. The, radio, the, uh, the railway was short-lived, closing in 1838. It did link the Cholden quarries uh, at Merstham with the River Thames. So it was an, outlook, uh, 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 an outlet uh, for the, uh, the stone uh, excavated from the Cholden quarries. Um, there's a, a plan. Um, there's probably not time to look at that in detail, um, but it shows the... Uh, uh, the terminus of the Croydon, Merstham and Godston Railway uh, just alongside uh, the quarry. If you, uh, if you go to a, a back issue of Subterranea, uh, you'll be able to find that map. And there's a close-up of, the, uh, of the terminal uh, and the entrance. Uh, so the, uh, the, the line swings round uh, towards the entrance to the quarry. And there were one or two... Um, plates found uh, at points A and B uh, when the site was excavated. <coughs> and uh, a lot of the plates ended up getting reused in the Godston mines. So uh, there are still plates uh, available. Um, the orig original entrance to Quarry Dean mine was a long vaulted, pas vaulted passageway, uh, which was late, later backfilled. Um, but if you have a look at the, uh, the, the black bit in the centre, just above that, uh, you can see the uh, uh, the brick vaulting, uh, which was the, the original entrance into Quarry Dean Mine. Uh, oh, sorry, not brick stone. Uh, and uh, there it is underground. So it's a lot more obvious what it was uh, once, you, once you get down there. Um, this is quite a small uh, quarry or mine, completely uh, separate now from the main children quarries. Um, and... Uh, I think the uh, the Wheels and Club uh, no longer have access to this one. I think they had a falling out with the owner. Um, again, it's it's very similar. All these quarries are, are, are very very similar once you get underground. Uh, this is uh, a, an area in Quarry Dean. Um, there's uh, uh, a, a walkway. Uh, a lot of the waste stone is, is just thrown to one side of the walkways, and they just leave. Uh, 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 en enough uh, for people to get through. There's no point in taking it all out because it's unusable stone. <coughs> so the, the stone blocks that are cut uh, uh, and ready to go out, they go out, and all the all the re rest of the waste stone is uh, used to make dry stone walls uh, to one side. Uh, uh, they, they would wall, wall up uh, worked out galleries, uh, and if there's a wide open passageway, they'd build uh, uh, stone walls 
or piles of stone along the sides of those those passageways as well, uh, just to maintain uh, uh, so long as there's a, a walkway maintained. Um, unfortunately, Quarry Dean uh, descends into the water table and it's prone to flooding, uh, as this photograph uh, indicates. Um, uh, I think uh, these have been dived, so uh, cave divers have gone as far as you you can in these. And uh, uh, in one of the uh, the flooded quarries, you can actually go through the flood water and get out into uh, uh, dry dry land the other side. Um, but that's something I've never seen. Um, the the stone was used locally. A lot of it was uh, uh, was uh, uh, taken uh, a long distance, but a lot of the stone was used locally. And uh, this particular uh, building uh, at Gatton Bottom uh, is, is built from Merstham stone. So if you have a look round Merstham, you'll see a lot of uh, quite a lot of the uh, the local stone uh, in, in buildings. It, it weathers very badly. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it was a good stone for uh, internal use, but externally uh, it weathers very badly. So a lot of the buildings have to be patched up uh, with something else. Uh, and again, uh, we can see uh, Rygate stone in use uh, in some of the buildings around Rygate. Um, uh, quite a, quite a, an attractive stone, I think. Um, Quarry Field Mine, uh, sometimes known as Football Field Mine, is adjacent to Quarry Dean, uh, but the two aren't currently connected. They may have been uh, one day. Uh, again, the uh, inner end of the working is dipped down to the water table, and this is the one where you can actually uh, uh, dive and go through the water uh, and, and come out into, uh, I, I was going to say fresh air, but it's probably no air but no water uh, on the far side. Um, uh, there's the uh, uh, water again. Uh, it, can, it can rise up uh, significantly during periods of prolonged rain. Uh, and uh, I, I've been down the shaft into this one a couple of times where you couldn't get much further than the bottom of the shaft because the, uh, uh, the water had come up uh, by, you know, 10, 10, 15 feet, maybe. Um, again, uh, the down dip workings uh, uh, are all flooded, but uh, Quarry Field also has some uh, up dip working places, and we're looking into one of the uh, working places there. Um, and in one of them, there are a couple of uh, uh, worked blocks of stone, uh, which I haven't shown. Um, there's uh, the survey uh, that the, all the quarries in Merston have been uh, extensively surveyed, surveyed by, um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the, the Wheels and Cave and Mine Society with the help of uh, members of Subrit. Um, Paul Sowen uh, was one of the uh, chief surveyors, uh, along with Peter Burgess, and, uh, uh, and I went along on a few surveying trips. Um, taking photographs, um, but they've been drawn to a very high standard, uh, and there's a section of the uh, uh, the massive survey, um, which isn't generally made available to the public, um, simply because a lot of work went into producing it, and it will get people into areas they're probably better off uh, not getting into. Right, oh, there's the, uh, the two... Uh, um, Trim blocks of stone awaiting removal in one of the updip uh, working places uh, at Quarry Dean. Um, so the, they 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 were uh, cut and trimmed, ready to go, and uh, uh, and they're still there waiting today. Uh, the pillar and stall method of extraction is uh, clearly seen uh, in this view of Quarry Dean. Um, Right, I think we've seen enough of the Surrey mines, so we're going to visit the uh, the Kingsway tram subway. Um, I think we have looked at uh, part of it before, but uh, we haven't looked at uh, uh, these pictures because these were only um, 
uh, scanned for the first time a few weeks ago. Um, this is between Oldwich and Hoban stations. Uh, we had uh, a second trip there. Uh, in We had our first trip, or the Society had its first trip in, in the mid-90s. Uh, and then in 2007, I was doing some filming with Suggs uh, of Madness, uh, and uh, he uh, arranged permission, or the, the film company arranged permission uh, with Camden Council, uh, and they came along. So I had a word with the guy and said, how about... Uh, uh, opening the, this up for a subrit visit. And the guy was um, surprisingly helpful. Uh, and it was arranged. And I think we had about 90 people along on a Saturday. Uh, unbeknown to him, uh, we charged three pounds per head. And this was all given to him. So he was absolutely delighted to get a, a carrier bag full of uh, pound coins uh, after he, he let us in. It was a free for all trip. Uh, it, uh, it wasn't guided, so once you're in, uh, sort of trip I like. Uh, I don't like trips with guides. I, I, I like to be left to uh, uh, get on with it. So uh, that's what happened there. We had a couple of hours there, and uh, everyone could wander around uh, and, uh, and and go where they liked. Because you couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't get out the other end. So uh, there's no way you could go. Um, what's interesting uh, about... Uh, the, the Kingsway subway is that the Strand underpass was built within part of within the uh, the southern part of the subway, so um, a lot of the subway was lost then, uh, and it's now used uh, by uh, by cars. But this is beneath the uh, up ramp uh, from the uh, from the Strand subway, so the the road is is above our heads there, uh, and you can see that uh, it gets lower and lower into the distance. So that is beneath the up ramp of the uh, of the Strand underpass. So as I was there taking pictures, I could hear all the uh, traffic above my head. Uh, there's uh, Oldwich Station um, as it used to be. Um, Oldwich Station is the is the southern station. Uh, there were two stations, one at Hoban, one at Oldwich. So this is almost completely lost um, under the uh, uh, when when they built the uh, the Strand underpass, uh, and that's what it lo it looked like after it was closed, after the uh, the, the subway was closed. But unbelievably, uh, you can actually still see some of it today and there it is so on the uh left uh we've got the uh, the up ramp of the strand underpass on the right we've got the tiled walls of oldwich station so there is still a narrow walkway between uh the strand underpass and oldwich station note the tiles uh, on the station walls and the poster boards on the right. If I go back to the previous picture, you can actually see the same tiled walls uh, and po poster boards. So if we go back again, there are those tiled walls and poster boards still there uh, and still uh, still accessible uh, by a doorway in the side uh, of the, uh, the, the uh, up ramp to the Strand underpass. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, during the 2012 uh, Olympics, the direction of traffic in the Strand, Strand underpass was actually reversed. Um, traffic seen going down uh, what is uh, normally the up ramp. So had to get a picture of that. Right, so that's the, the extra, the new pictures of the Strand underpass. I know you haven't seen those before because, uh, as I said, only scanned the negs for the first time uh, a, a few weeks ago. So we're looking now at the, uh, the Royal Observer Corps Group Headquarters. Uh, and there is uh, one uh, group headquarters remaining uh, in the uh, London area. Uh, it's the new semi-underground control bunker built for number five group at Watford uh, in 1961 in Cassio Berry Drive, 
uh, adjacent to the World War II group headquarters. Um, it was closed in 1968, but the bunker was retained as a secondary training center. I don't know if Bill Ridgway can tell us, but uh, it uh, it was when I visited being used by uh, a local vet's practice. So I imagine uh, they're still there. If Bill comes up with a comment, I shall uh, relate it to you. Uh, so this is the uh, uh, the Royal Observer, Observer Corps Group Headquarters, number five group uh, in Watford. Um, there it is from, from the other side. Uh, that's the World War II building. Um, I'm actually standing on the, uh, the roof of, of, of the bunker. Uh, there's a typical one, um, group headquarters. This one's Norwich, uh, long gone. Uh, and uh, that's a typical World War II Royal Observer Corps group headquarters. Um, this one's at uh, Gower Shields. Uh, south, south of Edinburgh. Uh, so we go back to the one at Watford. <coughs> now that's that's the bunker. So the square building is the World War II group headquarters, and that's the uh, uh, Aztec Temple, uh, as they were known, uh, a very typical ROC bunker. Um, there are still some of those that left. If you go to the, uh, the English Heritage, one that's home to the public at Acom at York, uh, that's one of those, uh, or there's one uh, in the grounds of Bracious Solicitors in Maidstone, uh, where they use it for storage of documents. So uh, that's uh, a, a, a typical of the underground uh, ROC group headquarters. They came in two parts, in two types, uh, either underground or surface. Uh, there's what it looks like underground, uh, spine corridor uh, looking towards the emergency exit. Uh, uh, that's the pneumatic sewage ejectors uh, uh, in, the, in the bunker. And there is the two level uh, control room uh, now used for storage uh, by the vets. Um, in some of those, uh, if you go to the one at Craigie Barnes in Scotland, they actually floored it over uh, in later years. Uh, but but uh, because this one was uh, closed in 1968, this one was never, never modernized. Uh, so the Watford one, uh, you still see the uh, the original floor uh, and, and the gallery above. Um, I don't know if anyone's uh, been more recently. Uh, I see a note. Uh, Bill Ridgway says nothing further to add. He's tried to get another visit, but not been successful. Keep trying, Bill. Um, you, you live in the right area. Um, they were very friendly when we went, but uh, uh, it, it's likely that... Uh, um, They've had probably quite a lot of uh, uh, requests for visits, so um, they decided uh, not to allow any more people in. Right, so where should we go now? The Abbey Mills Pumping Station. Now, this was an interesting place. Completed in 1868 and housed uh, eight beam engines. It had an underground boiler house uh, with 16 coal-fired Lancashire boilers. So that was my interest. Um, because, uh, of course, the pumping station itself isn't underground, uh, but the boiler house was. Um, so uh, when it was uh, all being uh, refurbished, uh, we were invited to visit. Unfortunately, the coal cellars were all going to be filled in. So this was the, uh, the last and the only opportunity uh, to photograph them. Um, we did get uh, an opportunity to climb up the scaffolding. Um, no health and safety considerations there, thank goodness. Uh, I, I shan't uh, go on too much about health and safety because I have, uh, I have views on uh, unnecessary health and safety. Uh, but uh, if we just go back to uh, the picture there where you can see the chimneys, uh, there is the uh, truncated uh, remains of the eastern stack uh, seen from the roof of the pumping station. Um, so there's quite, there's quite a lot still there to see. Uh, the newly restored lantern that uh, stands above the crossing point of the four bays of the cruciform engine house. So all this seen by climbing the scaffolding, uh, which you can see uh, uh, in the background there. Um, obviously, they shouldn't really have let us do that, but uh, 
we were just a small party and uh, uh, they were just as interested to find out uh, uh, some more information. So uh, uh, they agreed that we could uh, we could go on the roof. Um, there's a plan of the place, sectional uh, plan of Abbey Mills pumping station showing the underground boiler houses. But let's actually get underground uh, and another plan. But that's what they look like underground. Um, so it's uh, it's real sub territory here. Uh, surviving surviving section of the underground coal vaults. Bays in the background have already been uh, backfilled with debris. Uh, sadly, now everything has been backfilled uh, and the roof presumably collapsed in uh, uh, and, and all this has now gone. Uh, uh, more pictures. Uh, uh, showing the uh the, the uh, coal cellars um right so that's uh, enough of uh, the uh abbey mills so let's take a look at the surrey deep shelter scheme um this was a fascinating scheme to provide uh, deep shelters close to uh, railway stations for london so that londoners uh could uh, get to the country and get into uh uh what were very extensive shelters. Uh, there were five of them, Ashley Road, Epsom, Long Down Lane, Epsom, uh, Outward Lane, uh, Banstead, Brighton Road, Coolsden, and Gosden Road, Coolsden. They weren't all completed. Um, uh, Outward Lane, uh, Banstead in Chipstead Valley Road, uh, that, was, uh, uh, that was never completed. Um, three of them are still readily accessible. Um, Epsom Downs, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, well, let's take a look in uh, in some of these shelters. Uh, the plan right shows the site of the, uh, as mapped by Ordnance Survey, uh, this is Ashley Road. So although it is underground, uh, there was a, um, uh, a recessed, uh, walkway uh like a like a, a, a railway cutting uh to the entrance to the shelter uh so that is uh, clearly shown uh on the uh on ordnance survey maps um and then the the shelter is uh below below that um here's a plan of the ashley road shelter most of the shelters uh were fairly uh similar in plan um not sure what's happening to Ashley Road. I don't know if anyone's been there recently and had a look. Um, uh, but it was, uh, there were plans to turn it into uh, a gold vault. Um, and for a long time, it was used uh, for airsoft. So uh, that, did, they didn't, that didn't do it any favours. Um, Ashley Road was actually uh, my first... Uh, introduction to anything underground. Uh, by the 1970s, Earth had been uh, bulldozed in front of the entrance. Uh, uh, but in 1975, it was just about possible to squeeze in. So this is uh, um, the date of my very first underground exploration in 1975 uh, to the Ashley Road shelter. I was working on uh, Radio Jackie Pirate Radio Station at the time and a couple of the uh, uh the radio jackie presenters that's uh steve mason uh uh came along and uh, we managed to get down uh into the ashley road shelter um and there it was as we found it inside um uh the air shafts were still open and there's a section of narrow gauge uh rail that has uh, uh ended up uh, uh pushed up the air shaft um the the bar that you can see there on the right is the uh, uh, that's the canteen so that's a, a serving bar for the canteen um, and there's the entrance cutting which I described earlier and there's uh, the, the the OS map is again shown on the right so uh, that's what you'll see today um, I doubt it I doubt if that's changed very much uh, there's the door uh, as we found it the original door is lying on the uh, the ground nearby and someone had put a new door on it, um, but had, uh, uh, for some reason had, uh, had given up doing any work on it. So they'd done some restoration inside. Uh, they put uh, uh, they put lighting in, 
um, but it was so damp in there, uh, they decided it couldn't be used for anything. So when I took those pictures, um, probably uh, sometime in the 90s, the original door they take now, the new door they put on was there, but it was just wide open. Uh, <coughs> so, so anyone could get in. Uh, uh, Jenny Hunt said it looks a bit terrifying, the guy uh, crawling into the shelter. Jenny, it was, it was quite safe. Uh, it, 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 it looks a tight squeeze. I think it'd probably be too tight for me now, um, but it, it was okay. It was, uh, and that's what it was like inside. Uh, that was just inside the entrance. There's a, a winding tunnel for blast protection. So you go along the winding tunnel uh, and then you come into the, the shelter proper. <coughs> uh, that's the warden's room at the end of the entrance tunnel. Uh, a view from the bottom of the unlined ventilation shaft in Ashley Road. Uh, uh, and uh, you used to be able to get in that way, uh, but that's been uh, partially backfilled now, so there's no there's no way in from the surface. Uh, but when I first visited uh, in the 1970s, you could actually, if you took a ladder, uh, you could actually get in from the surface down down the air shaft. Um, that's the toilet cubicles. Um, all the shelters had uh, two lots of cubicles, ladies and gents' toilets. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the gents urinal still there. Um, I doubt it. I, I assume it's all still there today. I said these these were uh, 30 years ago. These pictures, but uh, I doubt if it's uh, changed that much. Uh, uh, and there's that um, serving area uh, or servery uh, uh, of the canteen. So uh, you would just collect your food. Uh, from, from the canteen, queuing up uh, at the uh, the serving hatch, um, and uh, it would have been uh, quite bearable. Um, very clean and tidy below ground, quite a lot of it unlined. It was cut into chalk, uh, and it wasn't necessary to line it, um, and uh, Ashley Road uh, remains in, in remarkably good condition. Um, not as good condition as uh, Godston, which uh, we'll see shortly or Kenley um, but uh, again they just uh, put some some netting on the roof just to stop any uh, any rocks dropping off um, some of it was lined uh, the towards the north end of it the, the shelter was lined so we'll move on now to long down lane Epsom um, again there's there's the ordnance survey map uh, of 1854 sorry, 1954, which shows the entrance cutting. It shows the extent of the bunker. Um, we tried desperately to get into this. Um, the entrance cutting had been filled with domestic rubbish, not um, old food, but old washing machines, uh, uh, and then it had been sort of earthed over and trees were growing in it. Um, but this is on Epsom Golf Course. Uh, and uh, we had a word with, um, or Keith Ward had a word with uh, the golf course, and they uh, had a, an idea that they could perhaps use the shelter as a storage room if we could get into it. So they actually gave us uh, permission uh, to try and get in uh, to this shelter. So we had a weekend and we tried and we tried and we we, we borrowed a, a mini digger uh, and um, we dug down through washing machines and, and all sorts of uh, uh, domestic appliances. Um, I think we got down um, about 10 feet, but it just wasn't enough. Um, and after two days, uh, we decided that our mini digger wasn't, uh, wasn't man enough for the job and we'd have to uh, come back with a bigger digger. Uh, sadly, um, the golf club decided uh, that it might not be their property after all, uh, and uh, that they wouldn't give us permission to come back. So uh, it was all wasted, which was uh, a great shame. Um, there was an edge uh, to the, uh, uh, the blast shield, 
uh, above the bunker. So we, we knew we were, we were in the right place. So we had to go uh, below that. But uh, uh, there, there, there's our hole. There's our, our helpers. Um, we had a, an awful lot of helpers came along. And most of them, as far as I can remember, weren't a, a great deal of help. Uh, but they did stand there watching. Uh, I think uh, Neil Baldwin was our, our, our operator uh, and he did a sterling job. Um, uh, and we, we tried really hard to get in, but uh, didn't manage it. So we'll take a look at uh, Outward Lane Chipstead, uh, which was, uh, uh, it was uh, about 500 metres from Chipstead Station in open land opposite Hazelwood Road. Um, Nothing appears on any maps, so we can't show an ordnance survey map of that. Um, but uh, a vertical aerial photograph uh, of 1940 certainly shows the site uh, where excavation was going on. So we, we know for certain where it was. Um, but what is there to see today? Uh, sadly, nothing at all uh, or virtually nothing. This was uh, uh, one of the, uh, the site of uh, one of the air shafts. Um, and this is uh, basically all that we could identify at all uh, as being part of the, uh, the shelter. There's a, a bit of timber there sticking, sticking out of the ground uh, from the air shaft, uh, but I'm afraid that's it. So uh, uh, I suppose a dig there uh, might be productive, um, but uh, uh, I don't think we're ever likely to get permission for that. So we'll take a look at uh, the Brighton Road deep shelter now. Uh, Surrey County Council sketch plan of the Brighton Road shelter. Um, it's uh, round the back of Cane Hill Hospital. Um, and this for many years was wide open. Um, I know Bill Ridgeway, Bill and Joan both came uh, when we had a trip there. I don't know if anyone else who's, uh, who's uh, watching this webinar uh, came on that trip, but that must have been in the well, probably late 90s or early noughties, um, but a fascinating place. Uh, uh, there's a, a plan of it as built. And when you get underground, uh, it's not as quite as good a condition as Ashley Road, but it's still a reasonably good condition. That's the blocked entrance tunnel uh, looking towards the Brighton Road. We actually went in through a, a roof, a, a hole in the roof uh, where someone had uh, knocked a hole through the roof and we just put a, a short ladder down uh, and it was uh, uh, quite an easy uh, squeeze in. Um, that's the dog leg tunnel. Oh, in fact, there is the hole that had been put in the roof. Uh, so we put a short ladder down onto the floor and you just let yourself down uh, onto that table. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and I think we must have taken about 40 people in there uh, uh, in uh, on, on this trip. Um, the entrance tunnel, uh, again, we saw the, the curving uh, tunnel at the entrance to Ashley Road. Uh, this, uh, the one at Coulston had a, a dog leg for blast protection uh, at each of the entrances. This is the north entrance. Uh, and uh, that's looking south from the sick bay. Um, again, if you, uh, Paul Sowen wrote an excellent, art, excellent article in Subterranea about the Surrey shelters. Um, there'll be uh, plenty of, uh, if you can get hold of a back copy of that or you can see it online, uh, there's plenty of pictures and plans uh, to see of this uh, and, and the other shelters. Um, it was used. Uh, Initially, it was used as an optical factory. Uh, uh, and when the optical factory moved out, in fact, they moved to Kenley, uh, it was used uh, as a motor repair workshop. Uh, it was after, uh, after 1978. Um, so all the, or a lot of the remains you see there uh, today are from the uh, motor repair workshop. Uh, and they left uh, quite a lot in there. Um, the Northern Longitudinal Tunnel. Um, uh, this was cleared by Hox Hargreaves, Cox Hargreaves and Thompson, uh, which were the optical people, in order to provide a very long chamber from uh, which to test the focus of the lenses 
uh, which were manufactured at Coulston. Um, this appears to be the end of one of the unfinished tunnel, uh, unfinished tunnels. Um, there's the uh, uh, the chalk waiting to be cut, and uh, the brickwork just stopped there, uh, and, and that's as far as they got. Um, the cause that the uh, the cause and shelter was never completed. Um, so when uh, uh, the optical factory Cox Hargreaves and Thompson moved in, uh, they used. Uh, uh, the, the partially completed tunnels. It never had the amount of cross passages. Uh, when we visit the, um, the Kenley uh, shelter soon, that, that was completely built with all its cross passages. Uh, I think Coulston only had uh, three uh, of the cross passages were ever actually completed. Um, but when uh, Cox, Hargreaves and Thompson moved out of Coulston, uh, they actually left some of their equipment there uh, and that's still there today this was used to deposit a thin film on optical surfaces um why they decided it wasn't worth uh, removing uh, i i'm not sure but they left it there when they moved uh from Coulston to kenley um we did manage to find uh, one old picture uh of a tea break at the Coulston shelter factory um uh, so uh, there, there's the workers underground at Coulston. Uh, there we have a, a blank slide. Uh, and then we move on to the, uh, the Goston Road Kenley Deep Shelter. This is by far uh, the best of the shelters and in, is still in use today as an optical factory. You can see the, the three longitudinal uh, tunnels uh, each with an entrance, and you can see all the cross tunnels. Uh, so that was uh, uh, that that was the only uh, of the one of the shelters to be completed. Uh, and uh, an underground party uh, was uh, held in the Kenley shelter in 1944, and an old photograph uh, of that has survived. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a picture inside the, uh, the optical uh, tunnel laboratory um, from their archives. They, uh, the, the factory have a small archive. Um, so it uh, this shows uh, uh, their factory in use in the uh, 1960s. Uh, Director John Thompson che checks an optical disc uh, in 1968. If he was there today checking an optical disc, he'd probably be using all the same equipment because as we'll see in a minute, as you go into the uh, into the factory, um, all the equipment in there is antiquated. Uh, the main entrance to Kenley Shelter, uh, uh, and you can see the company's name, Optical Surfaces Limited, above the door. So uh, please don't call there. They don't, they don't welcome casual visitors. Uh, the first time I went there uh, was uh, with Paul Sowen, who they knew, uh, and Keith Ward, and they said, yes, you can visit, but no photography. Uh, so I, I took the camera along anyway. Um, and uh, once we've been there about half an hour, they said, oh, if you've got your camera, you must have taken a few pictures. Uh, so they did allow us to take a few pictures, but not of any of their equipment in use. Um, but then I got invited back on my own and I went back and there was a, basically uh, I could take pictures anywhere uh, of anything and there were no, no restrictions at all. So, so that was good. Uh, here's a page from their brochure, uh, uh, which you can find online. And uh, that's what it looks inside the North Parallel Corridor uh, looking towards uh, one of the emergency exit tunnels. Um, I'm not sure which pictures I've actually put on there, so we'll just go through these. Uh, and again, uh, the main entrance to the tunnel complex, uh, that's the middle longitudinal passage uh, in the Ken Kenley shells are now brightly lit. Uh, and uh, all the, uh, uh, the uh, cross tunnels uh, lead off this tunnel. And the first tunnel just inside the entrance leads to their offices 
and to the toilets, uh, which we were allowed to photograph um, being uh, nothing particularly secretive. Uh, in fact, there are the women's toilet cubicles. Um, uh, the inner end of one of the northern two sloping ventilation shafts. Um, Chelsea uh, Speleological Society managed to get in um, in the 1960s, I think early 60s, before the optical factory moved there from Coolsdon. So it had been visited and it had been surveyed uh, by the Chelsea uh, Speleological Society. Um, but this... Uh, ventilation shaft has now been filled. Um, most of the internal tunnels have been used by optical surfaces for workshops, uh, but one or two of the cross tunnels haven't been used and they're just used for rough storage. Uh, uh, and that's one of those. Um, in the southern main passage, an embossed V for victory uh, has been embossed uh, in Roman letters and in Morse code, uh, dot, 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 dash. Uh, so uh, that is uh, to be seen on the walls. And there's a uh, <coughs> the frog of that uh, <coughs> that brick has been impressed with the word victory, uh, where the maker's name, the brick maker's name is usually found. So uh, that's another uh, reminder of the uh, uh, the shelter in the walls. Um, now we move actually into the tunnels uh, where all their very antiquated uh, equipment still remains in place. Um, as I said, I wasn't allowed to take any photographs of this on the, the first trip, um, but the owner wasn't present on the second trip uh, where I was invited back on my own. Uh, there was no problem with taking photographs of anything. Um, so, uh, it's a redundant coating machine, so similar to the machine that was uh, uh, left at Coolsdon. Um, and there are their, their smoothing machines. Um, they're made of wood. You know, it's no modern technology there. Um, but they NASA is one of their customers. Um, so they do actually um, provide very high quality uh, lenses and mirrors. Uh, and uh, there are a number of government uh, customers. Um, so all very antiquated equipment, um, but all still in, uh, in good, good order and still in use. And uh, that's a large smoothing machine working some uh, long glass bars. Um, it, it was really a fascinating place to visit and uh, I think it needs uh, recording in video as uh, as well as my pictures. At the north end of the middle tunnel at Kenley there's a chamber that's 20 feet in height. In recent years it's providing a useful loading area uh, with an overhead gantry. Um, they have a dust free test area. Um, I'm surprised quite honestly they uh, they, they let me into that, but uh, uh, they did. And uh, so we got a picture of that um, again from their brochure. Right. So that's we've looked at the deep shelters. So where are we going to go now? Anti-aircraft operations rooms. Um, there were several of them. Uh, and there's a list of the ones around London. So we're going to take a look at, uh, I can't remember which slides I put on, but probably Vange, uh, Lippitz Hill, Pendle Camp, uh, and RAF Uxbridge, uh, maybe. We'll see see what slides uh, come up. I actually put this uh, this talk together about 10 years ago now. So um, there's a, a very typical uh, two-level uh, underground or semi-underground uh, anti-aircraft operations room. Normally it was uh, either completely on the surface or one floor below ground and one floor above ground. Um, but that's, uh, they're all built to, to the same design. Uh, so this is the one at Pendle Camp. Um, uh, standard design bunker, one floor above ground, one floor below ground. 
Um, this is currently abandoned. Uh, it's at the junction of the M25 and M23. Uh, yes, uh, Kevin NASA. NASA were were a cust are a customer uh, for uh, their their lenses, um, unless they lie to me, of course, and unless they lie in their brochure. Um, right, uh, back to Pendle Camp. Uh, uh, this was used uh, by the uh, uh, police, uh, Surrey police, for a long time, um, but it was uh, when eventually they moved out. Uh, it's been uh, empty ever since and is currently, um, I think a lot of travelers have, uh, are grazing their horses there. So um, probably not the safest place to go around. Uh, there's where it is from the air. Uh, see very, very close uh, to the motorway. Um, you can drive virtually right up to it. Uh, not sure if you can actually see it from the road, but you can get pretty close. Uh, this is when the uh, the Metropolitan uh, Met Police, not the Southern the Surrey Police, sorry, uh, it was uh, taken over by the Home Office in the early 1960s and allocated to the Met as its Southern War Headquarters, uh, remaining uh, in use until 1991. Um, I went there in 1987, so uh, it was probably. Uh, my first visit to um, uh, a Cold War bunker. Um, I didn't really know what it was. Um, uh, I got a phone call, uh, said, would you like to visit a Cold War bunker? So, yes. Uh, and it was still uh, used by the Met Police as their Southern War headquarters at that time, but there didn't seem to be any uh, great um, problem with taking photographs. Um, the uh, WB 1400 carrier control point is seen on the table in the background with the uh, two WB 1401 carrier receivers, uh, similar to the ones you'd find in ROC posts uh, mounted on the wall above. Um, that's the, the old ops room uh, uh, seen from the gallery in 1996. This is uh, uh, a later trip, uh, five years after the Met uh, vacated the building. Uh, the handle equipment is seen in the uh, room opposite uh, and will there's the uh, a close up of the WB1400 carrier control point. Uh, I think this is one of my 1980s pictures. Uh, I think that had, uh, that had long gone by the time we went back for the for the later visit. Uh, but there was still a lot in there. Uh, the teleprinter room. Uh, in 1996, although the police vacated the bunker five years earlier, much of their equipment remained in place. So we move on to the, the North London Emergency War Headquarters uh, at uh, Lippitz Hill near Epping, in, in Epping Forest. Um, it was also a police training ground. Uh, so uh, when we visited that one, uh, again, in the uh, in, in the late 90s, uh, uh, there was lots of uh, police training going on, firearms training. Uh, so we had to follow a, a circuitous route uh, to get to it without uh, uh, crossing their, their, their training area. Uh, but it was actually being used uh, by them or the, uh, the main control well uh, was being used as a gym uh, and uh, uh, the were actually uh, people using the uh, gym equipment uh, while we were there. Uh, that's the uh, um, the upper level, uh, the, uh, the gallery looking down into the central well, uh, the lower level ring corridor, uh, the door in the center is the generator room, which we, not, I don't think we got into that that day. Now, the Arxbridge AAOR, um, probably the last built in the UK uh, because priorities had changed by then. Um, and this was actually um, in Attack Warning Red. Uh, uh, Campbell's Attack Warning Red lists all the AORs, but he doesn't list one at Oxbridge. Um, so there was no pos <coughs> positive uh, 
confirmation that uh, this one had actually been built uh, till a lot later, but it was built. Um, it was part of the uh, uh, US Air Force Station. Um, and this was uh, uh, what they put uh, the use they put the building to. Um, the US strip their bunkers quite thoroughly when they move out. So that's the original well uh, that had been floored over. That's the uh, lower floor seen here. And that housed an Autovan, which is a, a military uh, US telephone exchange um, apparatus racks. Uh, they vacated the building in 2002 and it was completely gutted. Um, so uh, I think my visit was probably about 2005, something like that. Um, the only equipment really left in there um, was the BT frame room, uh, which was uh, pretty well intact. Um, yeah, all the plant usually gets left, um, but the uh, 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 the AOR had a, a standby generator, but it was too small to power the new Autovon uh, telephone exchange. So the Americans uh, provided new generators uh, housed in uh, a new building uh, to the rear. So uh, uh, although they strip out all their uh, important equipment, uh, plant was generally left in place, and that's the uh, American generators. Um, right, Brompton Road, AAOR or GOR. Right, during the construction of the AAORs during the early 1950s, the World War II Gun Operations Center in the lift shaft at the closed Brompton Road station uh, remained operational. Um, now, we have looked at Brompton Road in, in a previous webinar, uh, but there's a few more uh, pictures of Brompton Road I'd like to show you because we did get a, another visit in there, actually courtesy of the MOD. Um, the first time I went to Brompton Road, uh, we had to uh, walk off the end of the platform at South Kensington Station uh, and walk along the track and up onto the uh, Brompton Road platform. Uh, but Martin Dixon... Uh, who is very good at arranging, is he listening? Yes, probably. He's very good at arranging visits uh, and he uh, managed to persuade the MOD uh, to let us into Brompton Road. Uh, and uh, we did have uh, access to the uh, uh, the non-MOD sections as well. We had a man with the right key, so we did get a, a tour of the entire station. So that is the gun operations room uh, it's GOR4 in the lift shaft well. There were five GORs at Brompton Road. Four of them were built in the lift shaft, and the fifth one, which was basically a training uh, GOR, uh, was built on the platform. So this is where the South London air anti-aircraft guns uh, during the war would have been controlled from. Uh, if I just go back to that one, um, you can see the, the openings you're seeing. We're in the bottom of the lift shaft here. So we're in the lift well, and the two openings are uh, the, the lift openings. So uh, they would have been slightly above the level of the well. Um, so uh, they would be the openings out to the lower lift landing. Um, and the ladder seen on the right is... Uh, emergency escape up to GOR3, uh, which is in the lift, lift shaft above. Um, GOR4 GR is on the far side of the brick wall. So um, the MOD uh, or the, the war office only had half of the lift shaft. So they bricked up the door, the lift shaft entrances on the other side of the shaft which is the brick wall you see here uh and the far side uh of the of the shaft uh was uh, uh remained with uh london underground and uh there's uh, the remains of a fan by the look of it just stored uh, on the lower lift landing now uh, one of the original world war ii maps is still in place um it's actually stuck to the wall 
um, which is why it's still in place. It's glued to the wall in the um, in the back of the the blocked the bricked up lower lift landing. Um, uh, so there's absolutely no way of getting that off. Um, there's the uh, operations room at the first anti-aircraft division in the lift shaft at Brompton Road. So that's what it would have looked like uh, during the war. And there's a, a close up uh, of the map. It shows the uh, heavy anti-aircraft gun sites in the inner, art inner artillery zone south. Uh, and it shows uh, Z, Z rocket batteries uh, and um it would be nice to get that out but sadly there's no way of getting it off without damaging it unless you can actually take the wall as well and uh, not really feasible at the bottom of a lift shaft uh, when you've got to get up everything up the emergency stairs um two banks of ga gas filters whenever you see gas filters in world war ii buildings they're always manufactured by Sutcliffe speakman uh and uh they are the same here. So there are a couple of uh, banks of uh, Sutcliffe Speakman uh, gas filters at Brompton Road. Um, that's the air conditioning plant, which is in the well of the D-shaped shaft. Um, one shaft uh, is only got half the shaft. So, so the rooms are all D-shaped. And the other shaft, they got the whole of the shaft where you built the uh, circular gun operations rooms. Um, that's the original style tile staircase leading down uh, to the emergency stairs uh, from the surface building. So the original uh, uh, tiling still in place there. Uh, and that's the top, uh, the top of the surface building. Um, ventilation shaft produce, uh, protruding from the roof of the station building. Uh, the shaft uh, must be incorporated into the new development of the site. The site has been sold to a Ukrainian oligarch uh, who is going to refurbish it as a, uh, as a housing of some sort. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the ventilation shaft must be uh, retained as part of the new development. When we went there, uh, somebody had managed to break in um, not sure how they did it, but uh, uh, someone broke in a long time ago and fell to their death down the shaft. So uh, it's the sort of place you don't want to be uh, playing around. Right, the Yule House Tunnels. Now, this is something completely different. Um, I'm just going to take a look at my... Uh, we've got 20 minutes, so we are running out of time. So we need to get through these quite quickly. Uh, yeah, Yule House was built in the 17th or early 18th century and located in Yule Village. Um, it had tunnels uh, beneath, uh, service tunnels, um, which were also uh, used uh, as an air raid shelter in World War II. And there's a plan of the Yule House tunnels, absolutely fascinating. So on the right, uh, you've got the entrance from the main house, uh, there's a little network of tunnels. Um, they don't actually lead anywhere now. So we don't know for certain where they came out, um, uh, probably in the high street at Yule uh, uh, and would have been a servant's way in uh, to the house. Uh, almost all of it is still there. You can see a little arm on the uh, uh, to the right of the, uh, the tunnel running south um, that has collapsed, um, but everything else is is still there. But again, um, they don't welcome visitors. Um, I've been three or four times um, and they've been friendly enough, um, but I don't think they'd welcome uh, lots of people knocking on their door. Um, that's the uh, uh, access to the tunnel is uh, from an ice house uh, uh, adjacent to, uh, to Yule, Yule House. So uh, that's their ice house, which they just use for storage. And then there's a, a, a flight of steps that lead down, as you can see, into the tunnels. Um, brick line tunnels, which uh, uh, the owners have installed lighting. Um, that's the uh, the main north-south passageway. Um, 
that's a short section of a well constructed brick line passageway uh which uh, has been formed into wine bins um which seems a a a convenient use if you've got uh, tunnels beneath your house uh you might as well have a wine cellar down there so uh, that's what they've got down there um that's uh, looking across the intersection of the main axial passageway um there's been uh these aren't roof falls it's a, there's a lot of soil has come in from uh uh collapses in some of the side tunnels uh uh but the main main passageways are clear um now this is where there's been a collapse unfortunately uh so that this is uh looking towards the old house um uh the main intersection uh to the right climbs steeply and may well have once gone to another entrance uh now sadly it's gone completely as you can see there so uh we'll go back to that uh it was quite shallow it certainly when it uh, uh, when it collapsed it reached the surface and uh, the road had to be partially closed off um we thought uh, that all that all the tunnels would be would be filled at that time um but luckily they only filled the uh the short section uh of tunnel that had collapsed uh so that is, is now completely lost uh but other than that uh the uh um uh the rest of the network uh is much as it was when i first visited uh said so this second visit was 2010. um same owners both times so they were friendly enough uh, remembered the first visit and quite happy to let me in again um marvelous vaulted brick buttressing under your house it, it's seen at a, a number of junctions in the tunnels um very uh, picturesque um right let's take a look at some uh uh borough uh control bunkers um there were all sorts of uh, levels of control each borough uh, had a bunker and they reported to um, sub controls uh, buildings like Pear Tree House or the Wanstead Group Control or the uh, Chislehurst or uh, Partingdale Lane Group Control uh, but the individual boroughs all had their own bunkers uh, and these would have uh, reported to the, uh, the group controls which would have in turn uh, reported to Kelton Hatch um so this is the uh, the edmonton borough control uh uh the entrance is via an anonymous door adjacent to the main entrance to the plevna road clinic in edmonton as far as i know this is now an asda now so if you're thinking of visiting uh, this one uh then i'm afraid it's a no-no um there's a good reason why you wouldn't visit um it was pretty well flooded uh, that's the generator um it was uh, several feet of putrid water uh, throughout the bunker. Um, not going to let that put me, put me off at all. So we just just waded through it. It was just me and Keith Ward on that one. Oh yeah, there you go. Asda uh, demolished in two thousand and eight to make war way for an Asda supermarket. Um, so that's the Edmonton one. Here's an interesting one: the two level. Uh, Finsbury Borough Control opened in 1940 with access from the basement of the town hall in Rosemary Avenue. The upper floor was used as an air raid shelter for the staff. Uh, but unfortunately, the lower floor flooded. So this is uh, this is the upper floor of the bunker. And there's the stairway uh, down uh, to the lower floor in January 2004. Uh, so the uh, the water had come right up uh, to the top of the uh, the stairs, um, but we had kind words with them. And we were very nice to them, and they actually agreed to pump it out. Uh, so we went back, and that's the same stairway uh, in March two thousand and four. For the water had been pumped out. Pumped out. Uh, note on the wall: there's an emergency escape ladder up to uh, a uh, uh, manhole in Gernalt Place. So I uh, thought that was very decent of them to uh, pump it out and invite us back again. There are a lot of nice people around. Um, 
there are a lot of not so nice people who quote health. I'm not going to go on about health and safety. Um, so there's uh, the recently dewatered messenger room uh, with a uh, uh, badly uh, rusted gas type door uh, at the bottom of the uh, southern stairway. Um, ventilation plant room. Uh, right, this is the Camden Borough Control, located uh, under a small public park uh, uh, at the junction of Highgate Road and Gordon House Road. Um, that's the surface entrance. That's the spine corridor. Um, this was welded shut. Um, the council, again, were very helpful and they came along with contractors and they uh, cut all the welds off. Uh, to give us ac access to the bunker. Um, trouble is, I went into this spine corridor, uh, just touched the wall on the right, and the whole thing fell over. So very dodgy, um, but we were in, so we got it photographed. Uh, that's the control room. Uh, and at the back of it, there's an emergency exit uh, ladder which goes to a shaft uh, and uh, another ladder up to the uh, adjacent park. Um, ventilation plant room, everything in, in very poor, dilapidated condition. Health and safety nightmare. Health and safety nightmare. They shouldn't have let us in. Um, camera, standby generators, uh, all in... Uh, Probably they would have only have done a, a few hundred hours, um, but uh, like the one at Paddock, it would probably take a while to uh, get it going now. Um, there was a campaign uh, advertised by the uh, Broadway Ham and High, which is a local newspaper, to uh, try and get the, uh, the bunker restored. <coughs> I, th I think it came to nothing. This was a few years ago uh, and nothing, nothing, nothing was ever done. Uh, the Epping Forest District Emergency Centre was located in the Second World War uh, RAF Sector Operations Centre at Northfield Air, Northfield Airfield in Essex. So absolutely fascinating place, this one. Um, and uh, uh, in extremely good condition. Um, a proper bunker, this is. Uh, as you can see. Um, and the control room at Epping, the bunker was partially rebuilt internally in 1986 and continued in service until the mid 1990s. So that's after the Cold War had ended. Uh, connection uh, to the ECN Emergency Communications Network maintained until at least 2000 and a Raynet radio amateurs emergency net network group were based in the bunker so when we visited there it uh, it was still in excellent condition uh this would have been the what, what that room so we'll go back and look at that room so so that's the control room and this is what that room would have looked like in 1939 uh, now this one is in the restored sector operations centre at RAF Digby. Um, so this is a museum. It's a museum within a working RAF station. So you can't just go along, but they do have uh, special open days. And again, uh, we they let us in on a on a non-open day, so we got to see uh, a, a very well restored uh, sector operations centre. So we go back to um, to Northfield, uh, and there's the uh, looking from the uh, the floor of the control room, uh, looking uh, at the gallery, uh, and there's the uh, original, uh, not original, uh, the later blast doors that were fitted uh, in the 1980s when the bunker was uh, refurbished. That's the entrance uh, airlock, uh, and uh, uh, in the 1980s, uh, it was uh, when it was refurbished, new filters were fitted. So uh, that's very typical of uh, filters to be found in uh, in many uh, 1980s bunkers. Um, so uh, uh, 
and in fact uh, the ROC uh, were, were going to be uh, fitted with those as well. Now let's uh, let's get back into central London, the Hackney Borough Control. Um, they won't let anyone in this anymore, which is a shame. Uh, started life in 1939 as the borough's APC centre, uh, ARP centre, uh, located beneath the car park at the rear of Hackney Town Hall. Uh, the control was reactivated in 1952 to serve the uh, uh, as the borough civil defence control, um, uh, remaining in use uh, until 1964. Uh, so a, a very typical uh, uh, urban bunker uh, with a small entrance uh, blockhouse and uh, the top top of a sloping stairway down to the ground. If you look in the the new issue of Subterranea, which you uh, will just have received, you'll see the aerial photographs of the, uh, the borough control at Lambeth. Uh, that was exactly the same design. You can you can actually see in the photograph uh, the slope sloping shaft <coughs> into the bunker. Uh, sadly, no pictures of the bunker. Um, what have we got inside? Uh, we've got more Sutcliffe Speakman activated coal air charcoal activated charcoal air filters in the ventilation plant but notice the bicycles um, the ventilation plant um, was powered was man powered by people sitting on bicycles uh, and they they used this method um, way into the cold war as well if you look at the uh, the bunker that's re recently been sold the Inverness bunker at Ragmore uh, that's got modern racing bikes um, so they still use the same uh, the same method of uh, powering uh, the ventilation um, control room at Hackney showing uh, the effects of uh, uh, the damp that's the the emergency escape shaft uh, and uh, uh, a lot of equipment uh, that the council are are now storing in the bunker now they're I don't know, they're probably, that's probably all still there, but they just won't, won't let anyone in now on health and safety grounds. Uh, this is the Ealing Borough Control. Um, fascinating place. It was originally planned as a new town hall for Southall, but only the, base, the basement was built. Uh, the vault doors visible in the picture were intended to be the uh, town hall strong rooms. Um, but uh, because the town hall itself was never built, built uh, the basement was used as the control for the Southall Urban District Council uh, during the Second World War, uh, and uh, it was uh, reused uh, in the in the Cold War. Um, badly flooded. Uh, that's the control room. Um, we did find um, it was quite gassy in here. Uh, hydrogen sulfide um, smells of rotten eggs. We could definitely smell it here um, and so we uh, we moved through very quickly it anesthetizes your your nose so if you are exposed to it after a while you you don't notice it uh, but it's eating away at you uh, doing its damage so if you smell rotten eggs uh, and they're generated by timber underwater um, uh, then get get out quick um, that's the rusting teleprinters in the tape relay room uh, at Southall. Um, equipment racks in the tape, tape relay room. Quite a lot of signage still in place, so we know who occupied uh, this particular room. Uh, when we went again, um, they weren't... Uh, they were aware that we'd found hydrogen sulfide on the sec on the first visit um, and uh, they made sure that we were properly tested uh, for any uh, when we went back again uh, and uh, the air was tested. Um, we're running out of time now, unfortunately. So uh, what I've got to do is uh, turn on my camera um, before I say goodbye to you. I would once again like to uh, mention my book. Uh, Secret Underground London. Um, I have at least eight copies, uh, twenty-five pounds plus postage. If you'd like a copy, I'm happy to sign it. Um, please email me at nick at catford uh, dot info. 
it's a very simple address nick at catford.info uh and uh if you email me uh then we can uh, uh sort out various methods of payment i hope you've enjoyed the third part of my talk um i've enjoyed uh, giving it to you there is a fourth part so if you want that um have a word with tony radstone and we'll see if it's possible to set up a date for the fourth part because there's still a lot to see in the london area that i haven't shown you it's um our capital had a lot of underground um sadly yes victoria you'd like it would you like uh, uh anyway Peter Nick, wants it as well yeah yes are you shouting at me to get off no 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 how many copies of the book you still got um i've got at least eight there might be ten i'm not sure um but there won't be any more um <laughs> but, so if you want one um please email me nick at catford.info and uh uh, and uh, then we'll see if we can uh, uh, I can get some money off you and uh, I'll get uh, I'll, sh I'll show it to you again in case you where, where, where is it there it is uh, <laughs> secret underground London it's Nick, absolutely full of superb pictures many of which you won't have seen in any of these webinars and lots of information and lots of plans it's in full color it's a very heavy book about 250 odd pages um, Bill, you're very welcome. You thank you thank me for the talk. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to to go through these uh, uh, questions or or comments as we go through, but I thought it important. Uh, there are 192 slides. I've, we've got to 184, so I'm just going to show the last few. Uh, that's the Southwark Borough Control uh, beneath the uh, uh, Health Centre, uh, Southwark Town Hall, uh, still open. Uh, it was all intact when I went down there. Uh, the lights were on. Um, I, I pulled the switch uh, in the generator room and the ventilation plant started up and then it blew a fuse. Um, uh, there is the, uh, the plant room at Southwark. Um, uh, maps still on the walls. Uh, and uh, that's uh, Redbridge Town Hall. This was uh, uh, an unfortunate um, we didn't really know what this was. Um, Red, Red, Redbridge, uh, I'll just turn my, set my picture off again. He'll, he'll cut me off when I've got to go. Uh, Redbridge um, found this, uh, this tunnel and they didn't really know what it was. So they invited us in and then they wanted to, uh, before we actually went there, they said, oh, we've got to provide uh, a, a, a uh, all, all the sort of health and safety regulations and a, a method statement and uh, and we provided that and then they decided we couldn't go anyway and this 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 young health and safety officer she must have been about 17 came along and said, oh no you can't go down they've got a ladder down it and i said well can i just go to the bottom of the ladder and just have a look and eventually she agreed to that and she let me go to the bottom of the ladder uh, and that was a mistake on her part obviously uh, uh, but unfortunately it didn't go very far so we don't really know what it was um, but that's it so we all we, we did actually make it to the end uh, so once again thanks for putting up with me um, I really hope you've enjoyed it um, if if you'd like me to come back uh, uh, then um, I'll gladly come back uh, but uh, do please buy a copy of my book Nick and Cat for dot info I'll bid you good night and because uh, uh, my my, my dinner is uh, uh, I can smell it so I want to go and eat it. Thank you very okay. much. Nick, thank you very much on behalf of Subterranea Botanica. Hopefully um, you'll sell your last eight books. Hopefully you'll come back and do a Christmas special for us. If you'd like me to, it'll be my pleasure, Tony. I think uh, it'll be everybody's pleasure. So thank you, Nick. Thank you everybody for turning up and we'll see you all again soon. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye -bye.